Okay, fantastic. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in for another semester of the Harvard CMSA uh, General Relativity Seminar. Today, we're very excited to have Harvey Rial from Cambridge. He's going to tell us about the second law of black hole mechanics and effective field theory. So I'll take it away, Harvey. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. So I'll be speaking today about a paper I wrote recently with Stefan Hollands and Aaron Kovac, which is uh, on the archive with, with this reference number. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, black hole mechanics. So let me start by just giving you a quick recap on how black hole mechanics works in uh, GR. So um, if, we, if we have standard general relativity uh, coupled to matter obeying suitable energy conditions, then um, it's known that, that black holes satisfy uh, several uh, classical laws. So the, the first law of black hole mechanics concerns uh, linear perturbations of uh, stationary black holes. So a stationary black hole is a time independent black hole. Um, if we consider a linear perturbation of a time independent black hole, then it satisfies this equation where um, on the left hand side, we have the, the, the linearized change in the black hole mass. And on the right hand side, T is the, the Hawking temperature of the black hole, which is related to the, the classical surface gravity uh, in this way. S is the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole um, related to the uh, black hole horizon area uh, like this. Omega is the black hole's angular velocity and J is its angular momentum. Um, so that's linear perturbations of a stationary black hole. Um, the second law of black hole mechanics is the famous uh, Hawking area theorem, uh, which says that the uh, area of the event horizon and therefore the, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is a non decreasing function of time. It can, it can increase, but it, it cannot decrease. So the standard example of this is, is a black hole merger where when two black holes merge, the area of the final black hole is greater than the sum of the areas of the two initial black holes. So that's, that's standard GR. These are classical theorems in GR. Um, and about 30 years ago, Wald showed that the, uh, the first law of black hole mechanics can be extended to a much larger class of theories. So he showed that a first law can be proved for any theory of gravity uh, arising from a diffeomorphism invariant Lagrangian. So this is a very large class of theories. Uh, typically, the, the kinds of theories that, that this includes are theories with, with higher derivative terms in the Lagrange. So things like uh, polynomials in the, in the Riemann tensor or derivatives of the Riemann tensor, that, that kind of thing. So for any such theory, one can, Wald shows that one can define in particular an entropy for, uh, for a stationary black hole uh, that satisfies this, this law. So it, it gives a definition of entropy for any uh, time independent black hole. And this is the, the famous uh, Wald entropy. Um, so that's the first law. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to be discussing the second law and asking whether the second law can also be extended to this, to this large class of theories. So the question is, can we uh, generalize the Bekenstein Hawking entropy uh, to construct an entropy for this class of theories which is a non-decreasing function of time and agrees with the Wald entropy in, uh, in equilibrium. So this is a uh, fairly old problem and people have thought about it before. So let me give you a little review of, of what's been done in the past. Um, so Ayer and Wald uh, in 1994 made a proposal for a definition of the entropy of a dynamical black hole for any theory of this type. So I'm not going to explain their definition in detail. Let me just show you an example. So let's consider Einstein-Gauss-Bonnet theory, which is the theory defined by, by this Lagrangian. So here we have the cosmological constant, the Ricci scalar, and then we're going to add a, um, a new term, which is a multiple of the, uh, the Gauss-Bonnet, the Euler density associated with the Gauss-Bonnet invariant. So that's, that's this quantity here, which is uh, quadratic in curvature. Um, so in four dimensions, this will be a topological term. So let's imagine we're in higher dimensions where this is uh, non-topological. So for this theory, the, uh, the IO world entropy uh, of a cross-section C of the event horizon is given by uh, this formula here. So the first term is just the usual Bekenstein-Hawking term. 
Um, but the, uh, the Gauss-Bonnet term here gives a new term in the entropy, which involves the Ricci scalar of the induced metric on the uh, horizon cross-section. K here is just some coupling constant, by the way. Okay, so that's an example of what the IO world entropy looks like. Um, so returning to the general discussion, uh, Aya and Wald showed that their, uh, this proposal had various nice properties. So it's free of various um, ambiguities which are present in the covariant phase space formalism uh, that's used to, to define it. Um, it agrees with the Wald entropy uh, for the case of a stationary black hole, and it satisfies the first law. However, they left open the question of whether or not it satisfies a second law. Um, shortly afterwards, uh, Jacobson, Kang and Myers um, investigated a special class of, of theories. So they looked at so-called F of R theories. These are theories for which the Lagrangian is a function of the Ricci scalar. And for this class of theories, they were able to prove a second law. Um, and so they gave an explicit expression for the entropy, which turns out just to be proportional to the um, derivative of this function F integrated over the horizon. Um, interestingly, their entropy for this, for this that satisfies the second law for this class of theories differs from the Iowald entropy, which suggests that Iowald cannot be the, uh, the full story. Um, so that was uh, almost 30 years ago. So now um, let me come to what we'll be discussing. Um, so we're not going to consider the second law in uh, full generality, in a fully nonlinear setting. Instead, um, I'm going to discuss the second law perturbatively uh, around a stationary black hole. So imagine we have some stationary black hole defined, uh, described by the metric G bar, and then we're going to perturb it in some time dependent way. Um, so this uh, H1 here describes some first order perturbation to the metric. And then there's going to be some second order perturbation and, and so on. So we're going to consider the second law in this uh, perturbative setting. And the physical situation that, that we have in mind here is a black hole which is um, settling down to equilibrium. Okay, so it's maybe some violent thing has happened in its past, but we're considering the, the far future where this black hole is gradually relaxing down to a stationary uh, black hole solution. Um, and this is probably the, the optimal setting in which um, higher derivative terms in the, in the theory could play an interesting role. Um, the reason I say that is if you consider some more um, uh, violent phenomenon, such as, a, such as a black hole merger, then in a black hole merger, um, the uh, area increase that, that you already get from classical GR, the, 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 the Hawking area theorem, is, um, is going to just overwhelm any, any small effect coming from, from higher derivative terms. And when I say higher derivative terms give a small effect, that means I'm thinking about them in the sense of effective field theory, in the sense of small corrections to, uh, to GR. So the, the, the situation where those small corrections may be more, play a more interesting role is when the area increase from GR is not large, and that's precisely what's, what's happening in this relaxation to equilibrium uh, process. Um, okay, so coming up to, to uh, more recent times, uh, progress uh, with this problem was made seven years ago by Aaron Wall. Um, so Wall, uh, in 2015, described a, a procedure or an, an algorithm for uh, defining uh, a black hole entropy for a given theory, such that it will satisfy a second law to, to linear order in this perturbative setting around a stationary black hole. And this is for any, any theory of this diffeomorphism invariant type. It turns out that the Wall's procedure generates an entropy which adds uh, certain terms to the Iyer wald entropy. And so therefore we decided to call it the Iyer wald wall entropy. Uh, although I don't know whether any of these three people would actually agree with that, uh, that terminology. Um, so the... Uh, the, the simplest um, kinds of uh, term, new term that are generated by, by Wall's uh, procedure um, schematically look, look like this. So the form KK bar, where K is a matrix, that's what these indices A, B indi indicate. This is the matrix which uh, describes the expansion and the shear 
of the um, horizon generators. Okay, so these are, if we have a, a horizon cut, a cross section through the horizon, if we consider the outgoing null geodesics orthogonal to that cut, those are the generators of the horizon, and this matrix describes their expansion and shear. This K bar describes the expansion and shear of the ingoing uh, gen null geodesics orthogonal to, to that cut. Okay, so the wall, the wall procedure produces terms like this, uh, which are added to the, to the Iowald entropy. Uh, interestingly, in this, this case of einstein gauss bonnet that I discussed earlier, it turns out that these wall terms uh, just happen to be absent. So you may have expected them to be there, but it turns out they are zero in that particular theory. Um, so as I said, this, this produces an entropy which satisfies the second law to, to linear order the perturbation theory. But if we're only working to linear order, then in fact the second law says that the, um, the entropy doesn't change. So if S dot is the, is the rate of change of the entropy, then delta S dot is the perturbation in the rate of change of the entropy. To linear order, the second law says this should vanish. And it's easy to see why, um, because if it were positive, then uh, we could simply multiply the perturbation by minus one. And because everything is linear, that would produce uh, something which was negative, which would violate the second law. And so to linear order, the second law just says that the entropy is, is constant, um, it doesn't, doesn't change. And so if you really want to see an entropy increase um, in perturbation theory, you have to go beyond uh, linear theory and work to, uh, to quadratic order in perturbations around a stationary black hole. And uh, that's, what, um, that's what I'll be describing uh, today. Just as a footnote, I should mention that for those of you maybe who are familiar with Walt Wall's work, is he also considered the possibility um, <clears throat> of, of coupling gravity to matter, um, which he described by, which was assumed to be described by an energy momentum tensor satisfying the null energy condition. And if you do that, you do get a genuine entropy increase. Uh, but there the entropy increase is coming purely from matter, it's not coming from gravitational waves, and it's also treating matter fields and gravitational fields in, in a kind of asymmetric way in the sense that it's uh, app applying the linearized approximation to gravity but not to matter. Um, it also seems a little bit unsatisfactory because in, the, in a general theory with high derivatives of the type I'm describing, you, typically you're not going to have a a clean division of your Lagrangian into a gravity part and a matter part. Instead, the higher derivatives are just going to mix everything up. And finally, um, even if you can do that with higher derivatives um, in the matter sector, there's no reason why the, the null energy condition would be satisfied. So, so we're not going to be uh, following uh, that approach. Um, okay, um, so there's an interesting uh, variational uh, picture of, of, of this, which, which we, we found helpful just in a heuristic way of thinking about things. Um, so let's assume that in a given theory that there exists an entropy uh, S which satisfies a second law. So it's increasing in time. Um, <clears throat> now, if we consider a stationary black hole and the stationary black hole obviously has constant entropy. So S dot is zero. And therefore a stationary black hole minimizes S dot, it minimizes the rate of increase of entropy within the space of possible horizon cross sections. So I'm not going to attempt to define what that means, but this is just heuristic. Um, so, so then we can ask, well, what are the conditions for a minimum? Well, the usual conditions for a minimum is that when we vary around this, this, this configuration, uh, when we vary, the first order variation should be zero, so delta S dot should be zero, and then the second variation should be positive, so this is the second variation of S dot. And indeed, we've seen that the, uh, the I.O. Ward wall entropy satisfies this first condition, its first variation is zero, so indeed a stationary black hole extremizes S dot, but um, it doesn't necessarily satisfy the second condition. And so the extremum uh, may not be a, a minimum, it may only be a saddle. And in fact, that's, that seems to be what, what happens in general. So that was just a, a heuristic picture that's, that's not uh, essential for following the rest of this talk. Okay, um, so that was background. Um, maybe if, if I could uh, could pause for questions here in case anyone wants to ask about the background. 
No, okay, I shall uh, continue. So let, let me describe um, our approach. So um, in our approach, we're always going to be treating these high derivative theories uh, within the framework of effective field theory. So let me uh, spend a, a few minutes explaining what we mean by that. So for simplicity, I'm going to focus on the case of uh, vacuum gravity, uh, no matter fields. Um, I'll make some comments about matter a bit later on. So in effective field theory, we'd, for, for pure gravity, we're going to we'd assume that the Lagrangian is just the standard GR Lagrangian, the cosmological constant, plus the Einstein-Hilbert term. And then we add to that um, uh, terms involving high derivatives, which are ordered by the number of derivatives. So the, the lowest number of derivatives that we, uh, that we can have is four derivatives. So we add terms to the Lagrangian with four derivatives. These are terms which are quadratic in, in curvature. So Ricci scalar squared, Ricci tensor squared, and this gauss bonnet term I wrote earlier. And then there are six derivative terms, then eight derivative terms, and, uh, and so on. And these all have some coefficients. And um, in effective field theory, we're going to assume that these coefficients are all given by appropriate powers of some UV length scale L. So the idea is that this L is, is a length, which is characterizes the scale below which our effective field theory breaks down and some more fundamental description is required. So these coefficients A1, A2, A3, and so on, are just dimensionless um, numbers. So that's, that's the kind of theory we're going to be discussing. Um, now, viewing these, these high derivative terms in the sense of effective field theory uh, restricts the scope of the second law in two important ways. So firstly, um, it's well known that um, many solutions of, of higher derivative theories exhibit pathological behavior. They, some, so there are solutions which exhibit um, oscillations, for example, on, the, on this UV scale L, or there are, there are solutions which, which uh, exhibit runaway or exponential growth behavior on, on the same scale. And these are all unphysical, okay? They're not, um, they're not um, solutions that, that, that we care about. And we don't care about them. Since we don't care about them, there's no reason they should satisfy the second law. So saying things more precisely, we should only consider solutions which lie within the regime of validity of effective field theory. Okay? We're not going to try to prove things about these unphysical solutions, but only solutions within the re regime of validity of the theory we're working with. So more precisely, what we mean by that is, if I let capital L be the, the smallest length or time scale over which the solution varies, um, so this could be, uh, for example, the size of the black hole, or it could be some dynamical time scale, for example, associated with a quasi-normal mode, uh, anything like that, we're always assuming that big L is much larger than the UV scale little l. So little l over big L is much less than one. And this means that we would expect terms in the equations of motion with increasing numbers of derivatives to be increasingly less important. This is just a very standard thing to assume in, uh, in effective field theory. One thing we do not assume is that the solution itself is constructed as an expansion in, in the small parameter little l over big L. I mean, one could assume that, but that would actually be very restrictive. Um, because typically when you do expansions like this in, in a time dependent setting, uh, you generate secular terms which grow in time. Um, so we're not going to be uh, making that assumption. Um, so in practice, in effective field theory, we won't, we're not going to know the Lagrangian to all orders in derivatives. So let's assume we only know the terms with up to n derivatives. And we can then write the uh, equation of motion uh, like this. We're on the left-hand side, this e mu nu, is all the terms with up to n derivatives. So the usual uh, GR terms from, with two derivatives plus four derivative terms and so on, all the way up to n derivatives. And on the right-hand side, this represents the effect of the terms with more than n derivatives that we don't know or, or we don't care about, okay? Um, notice I'm writing just order L to the n. I should really write little l to the n over big L to the n plus two. Um, but it's, it's a bit cumbersome to do that. So from now on, I'm going to suppress all of these big L's and you can um, reinstate them by uh, dimensional analysis if you want. So here's our, here's our equation of motion again. So 
Um, the second uh, key ingredient is that if we consider the theory uh, defined by this left-hand side, so with all the terms up to n derivatives, then we're not going to aim to prove a second law that holds exactly within this theory, but instead the, the second law should only hold to the same order of accuracy as the theory itself. In other words, the theory itself, we only know up to terms of, of this order, terms of order L to the N coming from uh, the higher derivative terms we don't know about. And so we're only going to aim to prove a second law modulo terms of this size. Okay, so from E mu nu, our aim is to construct some uh, entropy S that satisfies a second law. So it's increasing modulo possible terms of this size. So terms of the same size as the terms, the unknown terms coming from higher order uh, corrections to our effective field theory. And I think this is, this is the best we can hope for in effective field theory. And in particular, notice that it, by increasing n, if we, if we suddenly learn what the next order of derivatives in our, in our Lagrangian are, if we, if, we, if we can increase n, then we increase the accuracy to which the effective field theory is known, the right-hand side gets smaller, and we also increase the accuracy to which the second law is satisfied. Okay. So basically what we do in our paper is we show how to do this. Um, we show how to define uh, an entropy S that um, satisfies this equation uh, to quadratic order in perturbations around a stationary black hole. So in other words, a second variation of S dot is positive modulo possible terms of this size. So I should here emphasize that there are two things going on here. I'm talking about uh, this, this, is talk, this L to the N here is talking about the number of derivatives we're retaining. This quadratic order is referring to the amplitude of the perturbation when we perturb around a stationary black hole. Okay, so there are two different kinds of uh, correction going on. Okay, so we're working to quadratic order in the amplitude of the perturbations and uh, up to uh, retaining terms with up to N derivatives in our effective field theory. Um, so how do we do this? Um, so we do it by adding some new terms to the um, to the Eyer wall wall entropy. So these new terms are of quadratic order uh, in perturbations around a, uh, a stationary black hole. Um, so in equilibrium, uh, I'll describe how we do this uh, in in a few minutes. But let me uh, just give give a, an overview. So in equilibrium, um, our entropy reduces to the wald entropy. So for a stationary black hole, it, it has all the nice properties of the wald entropy. Um, and to linear order in perturbations uh, around a stationary black hole, it agrees with the Eyer wald wall entropy, and therefore it satisfies uh, the first law. Um, if we consider um, equations of motion where we retain up to n derivatives of the metric, then it's fairly easy to, to see that our entropy will contain up to n minus two derivatives of the metric. Um, and the new terms that our, our procedure generates always involve at least four derivatives. And so they only appear when n is six or larger. Okay. So in particular, that means if we consider the leading order higher derivative corrections to Einstein gravity, these are four derivative terms, so n is equal to four. And for these, for these, these theories, our procedure doesn't generate any, any new terms in the entropy. And so therefore, for, for the leading corrections to Einstein gravity, our result uh, implies that the Eyer wall wall entropy um, already satisfies the second law to, to quadratic order in this, in this effective field theory sense without any further modification. Okay, so the, the modifications to the entropy only appear when we go beyond four derivatives in the uh, Lagrangian. Uh, let's look at an example. Um, so the, uh, let's go back to einstein gauss bonnet theory. Um, so here's the Lagrangian again. Now I've, I've inserted this factor of our, our UV scale L. Um, <clears throat> let me do something which is rather strange from an effective field theory perspective, um, which is, let me take this and view this as an effective field theory for which it just happens that all of the coefficients of all the terms uh, that I haven't written down, all the high derivative terms I could have written down but haven't, all those coefficients are just exactly zero. Okay, that's very strange, but I can, I can take that as an, as a, an effective field theory and apply a, our procedure to it and see, see what we get. Um, so let's consider some cross section C of the event horizon. 
Um, and let me introduce the notation where little s is the entropy density. So integrating s over 4g will give us the, uh, the entropy. And let's, let's work through this uh, successively increasing the number of derivatives to which we believe in this theory. So let, let's say we only trust this theory, or we only know this theory up to two derivatives. So up to two derivatives, this is just standard GR, and in standard GR, we just get the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, which corresponds to S equal to one. Okay, so that will satisfy the, the second law, modulo terms of order L squared, coming from this, this higher order term if we, that we've neglected. Um, Let's say we can go, we, we, we actually trust this theory up to four derivatives. So we really trust this, this gauss bonnet term. Um, so if we believe in this theory up to four derivatives, then now, um, as I just told you, up to four derivatives, our procedure does not generate any corrections to the, to the IO world wall entropy. And so in this case, um, the, the entropy that, that we get is just the IO world wall entropy, which is this expression here, okay, which in fact, for this particular theory is the same as the IO world entropy. Um, but we can go a bit further. Let's let's go. Let's assume that we really trust this theory up to six derivatives. In other words, we really believe that the coefficient of the six derivative terms here is actually zero. Okay? Well, then we can continue um, our procedure, and now our, our, our method does generate new terms uh, in the entropy for this this theory that um, that my student Ian Davis has been uh, working out with some uh, heroic computer algebra calculations, and the corrections look like this. So remember. K and K bar are matrices describing the expansion and the shear of the uh, outgoing and ingoing null geodesics orthogonal to this, this, this cut of the horizon C. Uh, and so there are lots of different ways you can contract, contract the indices on these matrices together. Um, and so there are, I think, eight or nine different terms that, that one can write down here, but um, all of the coefficients can all be worked out uh, explicitly. And then in principle, one can keep going. And uh, let's say we trust this up to eight derivatives, we could then uh, write down uh, even higher order terms. Um, I'll explain why one might want to do that uh, a little later. Okay, um, let me continue. Um, so this was, okay, this is kind of a, the, the, the summary of what we've achieved. So um, going on from here, I'm going to get a little bit more technical. So if there are any general questions, maybe now would be a good time to ask them. Hello, we have a question here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the action only has four derivatives. So why would you consider an entropy with six? So, yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So, so the point is that, that our procedure, um, so, so the idea is we're going to view this as an effective field theory where we actually trust this up to six derivatives. So let's say I'm really, for some reason, I'm really interested in einstein gauss bonnet theory. I can view that as an effective field theory, which I trust up to six derivatives, but I'm trusting it in the sense that the coefficient of the six derivative terms is exactly zero. Okay, it's a very artificial thing to do from the point of view of effective field theory. And really I'm just using this as an example of what these higher derivative terms would look like. Okay, so in practice, uh, a more realistic situation would, would, would be where the six derivative terms are, are, are not exactly zero, and then you'll, you'll generate some, some terms here, which would depend on the nature of those terms. But, but in principle, you can just, you can do this, you can keep going, you just treat this as an effective field theory, where these coefficients are all exactly zero. It's an odd thing to do from the EFT perspective, but from the perspective of generating an entropy which satisfies the second law, it, it, works, um, it works perfectly fine. Okay, thanks. That's clear. Can I ask one question? Is so up? I've always been a bit suspicious about these th these high derivative theories because I often lose their uh, the well postedness property. So, uh, does the effective field theory property uh, does that take care of that problem? Uh, not in general. I mean, interestingly, if you just look at this theory and work within the regime of validity of effective field theory, then, then, then Aaron Kovach and I have shown actually that this does admit a well-posed initial value problem. It does? Um, it does, yeah. But that, okay. this, approach, this theory is very special because its equations of motion are still second order. Um, it's, uh, it's still an unsolved problem how to develop some theory of well-posedness for, for a... Yeah, because I, th I think in it... General. 
Um, but but none of this depends on that. We're just assuming we're given a solution okay. and the solution lies within the regime of validity of effective field theory. And then we can apply this, this procedure. But but I agree, it's it's a very interesting question for us, how, how one develops a notion of well-posedness for, for effective field theory. But it's, it's an unsolved problem. Thing. I should also point out IWW is the initials for a radical leftist group uh, from 100 <laughs> years ago, the Wobblies. Okay, we were Just unaware be careful of that. With it. Yeah, okay. We were, we were, okay, we were unaware of that, so we, we may have to be careful. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Harvey, I had another question. So, yeah. these corrections to, to the entropy, uh, of course, this new entropy also satisfies the same old first law. Yes. Yeah. The so, point is that the, to the linear order, these terms just drop out because k vanishes um, uh, around for the background solution. So, k k is quadratic. Um, uh, I see. Yeah. So, so basically, they, they don't they don't enter the first law at all. Like no. So 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 to linear order, everything we're doing agrees with what Aaron Wall did. Um, it's only when you go to quadratic order that you see differences. Okay. Okay. Thank you. OK, okay. so um, let me now move on to give you some idea of, 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 the, uh, of, of how we did this. Um, so the whole um, framework is based on a, a particular set of coordinates uh, adapted to the presence of, presence of, a, of an event horizon. So these are um, the Gaussian null coordinates. Um, before I describe them, let me just emphasize an assumption we make. So we're always assuming um, that we're working with a black hole space time, which has a smooth event horizon that settles down to equilibrium at late time. In other words, at late time, it's, it's, it's approaching a stationary black hole solution. Okay, so these are, these are the assumptions we're making. So here's, here's a picture of our coordinates. So this, this line here is, is supposed to be the, uh, the event horizon. Um, and we define these Gaussian null coordinates uh, as follows. So we take some cross section of the horizon that this, this dot here uh, represents, and we introduce some coordinates XA on that cross section. Um, we then consider the horizon generators uh, moving away from that cross section, and we let V be uh, an affine parameter along those horizon generators. Um, and then finally, if we're given, uh, if we pick some point on the horizon, we then consider null gd6, which is transverse to the horizon, and we let r be an affine parameter along those, those null gd6. And so the, the horizon in these coordinates is at r equal to zero. And the horizon generators have um, constant x and uh, affine parameter v. Okay, so that's the, uh, the coordinates that we'll be using. They're, they're the same coordinates that um, Aaron Wall used in his uh, work. Um, so the metric in, in Gaussian null coordinates looks like this. Um, so there are uh, three uh, non-trivial terms in the metric. There's this, this quantity alpha, this quantity beta, and this mu. Notice that mu is the induced metric on a cross section through the, uh, the horizon. Um, and alpha, beta, and mu uh, depend on all of the coordinates in general because we're considering a dynamical uh, black hole here. Um, so just a little bit of terminology. Um, this metric is a, seemed, has a, a scaling uh, symmetry. It's not, it's not quite a symmetry, but, but there's a scaling transformation we can apply um, where we rescale V and R by some constant A uh, in opposite ways, like, like I've written here. Um, we call that a boost. And we then say that a, a quantity um, has boost weight B if, if it picks up a factor of A to the power B when we, when we perform this transformation. Um, so it's easy to see from the metric that alpha, beta, and mu all have boost weight zero. Um, as an example of a quantity which has non-zero boost weight, we can consider the uh, expansion and shear of the, uh, the horizon generators. So these are described by this quantity KAB I discussed earlier. And in these coordinates, that's just given by the V derivative of mu, this mu here. Okay, this is a quantity of boost weight one under, under this scaling. Um, similarly, um, K bar um, is, um, uh, which is the expansion or shear of the ingoing null GD6. Uh, so the, the null GD6 
going inwards rather than along the horizon generators. That's given by the R derivative of this mu, and that gives us a, a um, quantity of uh, boost weight um, minus one. So I think I may have the scaling back to front here, but there's, there's some notion of boost weight for which this, some definition for which this is boost weight one, and this is boost weight minus one. Um, now, importantly, all positive boost weight quantities can be shown to vanish on the event horizon of a stationary black hole. Okay, so that means that when we're doing perturbation theory, any positive boost weight quantity like K is a quantity that's, that's of first order. Okay. Um, so before we go to Question. the second order, yeah, go ahead. So uh, this, to prove this last statement, do you have to assume that the solution admits a sort of nice Taylor expansion near the horizon? Um, well, not really. Um, you're assuming we're assuming the horizon is smooth, but beyond that, we're not we're not really assuming anything else. No. Um, okay. We're assuming the zeroth law of black hole mechanics holds. In other words, that the surface gravity is constant on the horizon. That that is used. But that actually has been okay. proved in a perturbative sense by uh, the group of Scientani and Bhattacharya. Um, right. Okay. Right, thank you. Um, okay, so let me remind you how the, the usual proof of the second law works. Um, and it, so because I've made these various assumptions like smoothness of the horizon and settling down to equilibrium, the, um, the proof of the second law is actually very simple. Um, so the usual formula for the rate of the increase of horizon area, so this dot is a V derivative, V is the affine parameter along the horizon generators. The rate of increase of the horizon area is given by the integral of the trace of K. The raising and lowering of indices here is done with this, this metric mu on the horizon cross section. So this is just the expansion of the horizon generators. Um, we can look at, we, we have ratio Jury's equation, which is just the equation for the VV components of the Ricci scale, Ricci tensor, which, which looks like this. Um, and uh, if we assume that the space-time satisfies the null convergence condition, which is the condition that RVV is non-negative, then this right-hand side is clearly less than or equal to zero. And so therefore the expansion of the generators, KAA, is a decreasing function. However, our assumption of late-time equilibrium implies that this quantity KAA vanishes at late time. That's because it is a boost weight one quantity. And I just told you that boost weight one quantities vanish for a stationary black hole. And at late time, we are approaching a stationary black hole. So we have a state, we have a decreasing quantity, which is tending to zero. And therefore that quantity must be non-negative. Um, so the expansion is non-negative and therefore the uh, A dot is also non-negative. So the horizon area is increasing or non-decreasing. Okay, so that's the usual proof in the second law. And usually the null convergence condition is, a, is an output of Einstein's equation. If one assumes that the matter in your space time satisfies the null energy condition. Um, however, in, in a theory with higher derivatives, such as the theories I'm talking about, the Einstein equation is now going to give us that RVV is um, some equal to some combination of, of higher derivative terms, which is of order L squared, and there's no reason for it to have a good sign. And so there's no reason now, it's not obvious that the right-hand side is going to be, uh, to, to have a sign. Um, well, you might think though, that when effective field theory is valid, that this, this two derivative contribution, this KK term here, which is a um, something which does have a sign might dominate the high derivative stuff because the high derivative stuff is by assumption small. But the issue there is that under some circumstances, K might also be small. Okay, and then K would not be dominated by, would not dominate these higher derivative terms. In particular, there's no reason why um, K should dominate terms like, for example, this. So this, this is this beta thing in the metric. Um, if K happens to be small somewhere, there's no reason it's, it, it, it's going to overwhelm terms like this, or even like this, where this is the uh, derivative of K along the horizon cross section. So in general, um, validity of effective field theory does not guarantee that the right-hand side here has a, has a definite sign. Um, in fact, in linear theory, you can see this is second order, whereas because K is, is, is something which is first order in, in perturbation theory, whereas this might be linear, and therefore uh, this would dominate in perturbation theory. So we need to, so therefore the, the, the usual proof of the second law simply doesn't work with, with high derivatives. And so the area theorem does not, um, does not hold. Um, and that's why we need to find a different definition for the entropy, of course. Um, can, can I ask a question? 
Yeah. So would would K be expected to generically be, be large though? Um, I guess there are various meanings to the word generic. So I guess you could talk about a generic solution and then you can talk about a generic point on the horizon of a generic solution. Um, you could ask in a generic solution, could there be points on the horizon where K happens to be small? Um, there might be, I don't know the answer to that. I guess my, my point though is that the second law is a law that should just hold, right? Subject to our validity right. of effective field theory assumption. Right. Even, law, even for special conditions, yeah. Even Yeah, even if we do some kind of fine tuning, we're talking about classical solutions, um, I think that we, we we just want the second law to hold, right? We don't want it to, to only hold in certain certain circumstances. So, um, but I think, it, it, yeah, the, if, if K does happen to be small somewhere and you then perturb that solution, then at least for some time, K is going to remain small and, and this problem would remain. So, so that, that generically, there will be some generic class of space times for which this is an issue, basically. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, Okay, um, so we, in our approach, we make use of something called an entropy current. So let me spend a minute or two to explain what that is. So an entropy current is a vector field uh, tangent to the horizon. So it has a, a V component SV and components SA uh, in, the, in the spatial directions of the horizon. Um, and just for orientation for standard GR, the entropy current just has components one zero. So bear that in mind. So then in terms of the entropy current, um, the entropy of a, a cross section of constant V of the horizon, so I'll call that C of V, is just given by the integral of the time component of the entropy current over the horizon cross section with its induced metric um, mu. Okay. Um, just some notation, I'm going to introduce the divergence of the entropy current, which is defined like this. So here mu again is just the metric on the horizon cross section. Um, this D here is the covariant derivative defined by that metric on the horizon cross section. So this is a kind of generalized divergence of the entropy current on the horizon. Okay. And so for orientation in standard GR, the divergence of the entropy current is just the trace of K, which is just the expansion of the horizon generators. Okay, so this is the thing in G standard GR that, that I explained a few minutes ago is, is positive. Um, if we now look at this definition of the entropy, if we take its time derivative, the V derivative, uh, we get, get this formula here. And now because this final term here is just a divergence, we can replace this by the, by the divergence of the entropy current uh, like this. Okay. So this is the thing we, we want to show is, is positive. And if we were to copy the usual strategy I just explained for GR, the, the aim would be to show that the divergence of the entropy current is a decreasing function. Okay, so then uh, repeating the argument we had earlier, if we assume late time equilibrium, this is a boost weight one quantity. At late time, boost weight one quantities must vanish. So this would tend to zero. If it's decreasing and tends to zero, it has to be positive and hence S dot would be positive. Okay, so if, if we could show this, then we could show uh, the second law. But unfortunately, uh, we can't show that. Uh, in fact, um, I don't know any way of getting, getting to that equation. So that's, that approach does not work. So we have to do something else. Um, so to tell you what you do, let me first um, say that uh, Wall's approach, the yeah, Aaron Wall's entropy um, can be formulated in this language of an entropy current. And that was shown by the group of uh, Bhattacharya uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so what they showed is that if, if the equation of motion is, um, is this, E mu nu equal to zero, um, then they can define uh, an entropy current uh, for the wall, uh, the Iowa wall, wall entropy, such that its, its V derivative uh, takes this form. So EVV is the uh, VV component of the equation of motion, and F is something of quadratic or higher order in positive boost weight quantities. And this is kind of a generalization of the ratio jury equation. In ratio jury, this would say dv of expansion is minus rvv minus k squared. That's the term, that's what we wrote down earlier. So this is a generalization of ratio jury's equation to this to, to these high derivative theories. Okay. So this f here in particular contains this, this k squared term that we, we saw earlier. So basically what we do is we take this, this equation with this uh, entropy current 
And the aim is to understand this, this stuff this of quadratic or higher order in positive boost weight quantities. Okay, so this is this is stuff that's all therefore quadratic order in perturbation theory around the stationary black hole. And um, what we show is that this F can be rearranged in a nice way to have a nice structure um, at the expense of going on shell. So I should have said this is an off shell equation. But if we go on shell, in other words, we're going to use the equations of motion and we're going to invoke our validity of effective field theory assumption. So that that's not required here, but we are going to need it when we go to, uh, to, to quadratic order. So um, assuming that um, we know the effective field theory equation of motion up to n derivatives, so the equation we had before, these are the terms with up to n derivatives we know, these are the terms with more than n derivatives that we don't know, then what we do is that we work order by order in derivatives using a, a, an inductive argument. And what we show is that at each order we can use equations of motion um, to manipulate this, this equation um, in such a way that um, we find that we can by add new terms to the entropy density SV to define an improved entropy density, which we call capital SV, and an associated entropy current such that we get this equation. Okay, so we've, we've, we get the time derivative of the divergence of the, of the improved entropy current has this form I've written on the right hand side, which I shall now um, explain. So on the right hand side, we've got the usual kk term that we saw in Ray Chaudhuri's equation. Um, but we, we've now got this x. So this x here is some, um, some quantity arises, a symmetric object arising from the, the higher derivative terms. But notice this first term is a perfect square, and so it has a, it has a good sign. Um, the other term in this equation is this term. This again has a structure, it's a divergence. It's a divergence of this quantity y. Um, and then finally, there are correction terms. The correction terms arise both from the unknown terms in our original equation and also from various manipulations that we do along the way to, uh, to derive this equation. Um, so importantly, the terms that we're adding to the entropy density when we improve it are quadratic order in positive boost weight quantity, quantities. And importantly, this y is also of quadratic order. Um, so as an example of, of, of what we do in, in this approach is that there, there, there are terms, going back to this equation here, terms in F, which, which look hard to control. So terms like this, for example, uh, remember beta is the, the VA component of the, of the metric. Um, things like this, um, well, they're not obviously controlled by K, so we have to do something with them. What do we do with them? Well, this uh, DV beta can be related to the Ricci tensor like this. So these dots denote things that, that, that we can control. So the idea is to eliminate this in favor of the Ricci tensor and then use the equation of motion to eliminate the Ricci tensor. So the equation of motion relates the Ricci tensor to the, to the higher derivative stuff. The higher derivative stuff comes with extra powers of L. And so by using the equation of motion, we basically push these problem terms to, uh, to higher order in L. And we can do that at, at each order, uh, eliminating them order by order. Um, okay, so how do we get a second law from this? So here's our, here's our equation again. We make our assumption of late time equilibrium, which means that the divergence of the entropy current vanishes as V tends to infinity. Um, so if we integrate this equation from some initial time V zero to infinity with this uh, and use this assumption, we get an equation for the uh, divergence of the entropy current at time V zero as an integral of this right-hand side. Okay. Um, if notice this is still not something that has a definite sign, this first part here has a definite sign, this k, k plus x squared has a definite sign, but this divergence of y does not necessarily have a good sign. But what we can do now is we now integrate this over the horizon cross section, as I explained a few minutes ago, that gives us the rate of increase of entropy at time v0. Okay, so s dot at time v0 is the integral over a horizon cross section of this. Um, so doing that into plugging, plugging this expression for the divergence into S dot gives us this big equation here. And this sort of looks like we're almost there because we're now we've got this, this divergence and we're integrating over the horizon cross section. So it looks like that divergence just wants to go away. But we have to be careful here because this is a divergence with respect to the metric at time V primed. And this is an integral at time V zero. 
Okay, so, so in fact, this is not a divergence uh, that, that we can integrate away uh, immediately using this, this measure. Um, however, I told you earlier that Y is of quadratic order in perturbations. And so if we're only interested in evaluating the rate of entropy increase to quadratic order, then since Y is already of quadratic order, we can evaluate this derivative D in the background space time, which is stationary. And since it's stationary, this um, D doesn't depend on time anymore. And so now we can do this trick of just integrating this away because we're, we're integrating over a, over a cross section. So now to quadratic order, this term does drop out and we learn that the second variation or the quadratic piece of the rate of entropy change is indeed positive modulo terms of order L to the N. In other words, modulo terms of the same order as the terms we didn't know in our original effective field theory. And so therefore we've shown that, that a second law holds two quadratic order in this um, sense of uh, effective field theory that I've, uh, that I've explained. Okay, so that's, that's how, we, uh, how we prove the result. Um, so a few uh, comments on this. So here's our, here's our result again. Second variation of the rate of entropy increase is, is, is non-negative, uh, modulo uh, the, the, the unknown terms, terms of the same size as the uh, terms, unknown terms in our, in our uh, um, high derivative terms in our equations of motion. And so this was, this was for vacuum gravity, which was the case we discussed in most detail in our paper. Um, but so you can ask, does this also hold with matter fields? And with, with matter fields, there's a fairly natural way that one would expect this to work out, which is that if the matter fields are such that the two derivative terms in the matter action satisfy the null energy condition, then the idea is to use them to control higher derivative terms involving the matter fields in the same way that we used K here to control higher derivative terms in, in pure gravity. So there'd be extra terms in this equation where arising from completing the square uh, on, the, on the matter fields. Um, and so we expect that to work out when the matter fields uh, at the two derivative level obey the null energy condition. And so we showed that this does work out for the simplest kind of matter field, which is, which is a scalar field. So the effect of field theory of gravity plus a scalar field does indeed, um, uh, it does all work out for that case. And you get an extra term here, which is uh, quadratic in the, in the scalar field coming from the scalar field energy momentum tensor in the, in the two derivative theory. Um, okay, um, so to uh, wrap up, there are a couple of outstanding uh, issues that I want to discuss with, with our approach. So the first concerns is gauging variance. So um, in the way I've explained it in proving the second law, this, this dot was always a dot with respect to V, which was an affine parameter along the um, horizon generators with respect to some particular choice of Gaussian null coordinates. But in, in standard GR, the second law can be proved much more generally than that. It can be proved for two arbitrary cuts of the horizon. So we have two cuts, C and C primed, with C prime to the future of C. And we can ask, um, how does the second law, can, can we discuss the second law uh, in this situation? So where, where we don't necessarily know that they're, that, that they're surfaces of constant V. Uh, and we can, so, so the idea is, is to use some gauge uh, freedom in the choice of Gaussian null coordinates. So we can always set up our Gaussian null coordinates so that C is at V equal to zero. Um, and then we can always rescale the affine parameter along the horizon generators in a way that depends on X, in other words, it can differ from generator to generator uh, in such a way that C primed is also uh, a cut of constant V. Okay, so now we've set up our coordinates so that C and C primed are constant V cuts of the horizon. And then our result tells us that the entropy of C prime is greater than the entropy of C, at least a quadratic order in, in this effective field theory sense I've, I've described. So that, that looks good. However, we need to check that the definition of the entropy of C is gauge invariant under this rescaling of the affine parameter, because otherwise we've set things up so that the entropy of, of, of C would depend on C primed, which is clearly uh, unsatisfactory. 
Okay, so we need to check that our, our definition of entropy is gauge invariant when we perform this kind of rescaling of the affine parameter of the uh, horizon generators. Um, and in fact, this is an issue, not just in our approach, but even for the, um, the IO world wall entropy. So, so Aaron Wall's approach is also based on these the same coordinates and it has the same issue. Um, now for that case, for the, the IO world wall entropy, we, we are able to prove um, in our paper that, that the entropy is indeed uh, gauge invariant. So, so the problem uh, is not there uh, in, in that case. Um, and as I explained earlier, if we're looking at um, n equal to four, in other words, a theory with up to four derivatives in the Lagrangian, then our entropy is the same as the IWW entropy, and therefore our entropy is also gauge invariant. So in particular, if you're just looking at the leading order EFT corrections to, uh, to Einstein-Hilbert, then, then our entropy is gauge invariant. Um, but we can ask about um, what happens if we have more than four derivatives. Um, so in the case of vacuum gravity, uh, it's quite easy just to write down what possible terms could appear in the entropy. And by doing that, you can see that um, gauge non-invariant terms just can't occur for n less than eight. So in particular, if we go to n equal to six, uh, this, the, which is the, uh, the next to leading order corrections to Einstein gravity, then everything is still gauge invariant for vacuum gravity because nothing, uh, there's nothing getting, that's gauge non-invariant that can be written down. However, when you get to n equal to eight, uh, so eight derivative terms in the Lagrangian, then it seems it's possible that gauge non-invariant terms might appear, and we don't know whether or not they will appear. Okay, so this is something that, that my student Ian Davis is, is looking at at the moment for this, this um, einstein gauss bonnet example uh, I described earlier. Okay, but at least up to, uh, up to six derivatives, up to and including six derivatives uh, for vacuum gravity, everything is, is gauge invariant. Um, the other uh, issue I want to describe is uh, the issue of uh, field redefinitions. Um, so our, our definition of, of dynamical black hole entropy appears not to be invariant under effective field theory field redefinitions. So for example, if you just take vacuum gravity, r mu nu equal to zero, and then perform a field redefinition of the metric where we add a term proportional to the Ricci tensor or the Ricci scalar uh, with this UV scale L and some coefficients C1 and C2, um, then this is going to, this will generate, it's well known that this will generate R squared, uh, Ricci scalar squared and Ricci tensor squared terms in the action. Okay. Um, so it changes the action. Um, so we can ask, does it, does our definition of the entropy also change? In other words, does the entropy um, arising from the, the new action agree with the entropy arising from the old action uh, on shell? And it seems that uh, the answer is no, uh, at least not at, at quadratic order. It seems that the, the entropy will actually uh, differ after the field uh, redefinition. Uh, actually, one thing I should emphasize is, is that when you do a field redefinition, you might wonder about the definition of the event horizon. The event horizon is defined with respect to the causal structure of G. But if we redefine the metric, you might worry about redefining the causal structure. But here, notice that we're doing a field redefinition, which is actually trivial on shell. So these, these corrections vanish on shell, and that's why that's, why that's not actually an issue. So anyway, our, 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 definite, our construction uh, seems not to be invariant under field redefinitions. And so the question is whether this is a problem. And um, I think maybe the answer is no. And it's to do with the question of whether thermodynamic entropy is unique uh, outside of equilibrium. Um, so it's, it's well known in thermodynamics that defining what you mean by entropy uh, away from equilibrium is subject to all sorts of ambiguities associated with, with coarse graining and so on. Um, and a nice example from, from recent, fairly recent discussions comes from um, fluid dynamics. So there, there's been quite a lot of work on the case of a relativistic viscous fluid. Um, and it's been shown that, uh, so people have, have written down the most general entropy current for a relativistic viscous fluid and found that it's not unique. The, the most general entropy current satisfying a second law has free parameters in it. Um, and so that seems to be another example where, where one has non-uniqueness of, uh, of the entropy. And so maybe what happens is that when you do a field redefinition uh, in our approach, it just maps between different possible definitions of the entropy 
uh, all of which uh, satisfy a second law, and uh, all of which agree with the world entropy in, in equilibrium as, uh, as they should. Okay, so to, to wrap up, um, we've, uh, in our paper, we introduced a procedure for defining black hole entropy such that the second law is satisfied to quadratic order in perturbations around a stationary black hole uh, in this sense of effective field theory. Uh, so there are various things that, that will be interesting to do in future. So main thing, I think, is just working out some examples. Um, so the, so our, our, our paper is mainly a, a proof that this can be done, but actually doing it is, uh, is quite a lot of work. So working out oh, some gosh. examples. Is, uh, is, is, is the first thing. Inclusion of various types of matter fields, for example, the Maxwell fields, uh, that will be interesting. So the most general effective field theory of Einstein gravity, of, of gravity plus a Maxwell field. As I've explained, there's this issue of gauge invariance that we need to understand. Um, one thing that we might wonder about is, is whether there's any connections here with the fluid gravity correspondence, um, which uses similar kinds of ideas um, but it's, it's doing something slightly different. So the fluid gravity correspondence has a, um, only applies in a very restricted set of circumstances, um, whereas, we, whereas our, what we're doing is, is um, applies much more widely, but, on the other, but the fluid gravity correspondence gives a more refined uh, result, I think, when it applies. Uh, and then finally, uh, of course, everything I've said is only perturbative. It works to quadratic order. And so there's a question of whether one can go beyond quadratic order. And uh, of course, the, the main question is whether one can do something at the, the fully uh, nonlinear, non perturbative level. OK, thank you for your attention. Hi, right, let's all thank Harvey for a fantastic, very clear talk. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. So just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Harvey, could I just quickly ask uh, the um, oh, it just went. I'm sorry. Keeps what assumptions building into your vector field theory? Say that again. What what are my what assumptions am I building into it? So essentially, not not very much at all, really. Um, so in in the case of pure gravity. All we're assuming is that, is that we have a theory like this, where we just write down um, the most general thing we can write down, ordered by a uh, number of derivatives, such that the Lagrangian is a, a diffeomorphism uh, invariant scalar. Um, so it's just adding these high order derivatives. Yeah, adding adding terms with, with more and more derivatives. Yeah, so that, that's always the, uh, the, the I think the, the approach in effective field theory. You just add 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 terms with increasing numbers of derivatives uh, and introduce some scale uh, on which the, the theory is supposed to be valid. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I have a question. Um, could you just say again how you handled the Ricci tensor term using the field equations? I uh, just couldn't count quickly the weight, the order of perturbation to see how you could use the field equation to yeah, eliminate that term. Eliminate this, this thing here. So yeah, right. so first, is this what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the first thing I should emphasize is this beta. If we go back to what, what is beta, beta is this metric term here. You see it comes with a factor of R. And at the horizon, R is equal to zero. So in order to, to get beta, I have to take an R derivative of the metric to, 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 to isolate beta. So beta itself is already a one derivative quantity in that sense. Um, and that means that the V derivative of beta is a two derivative quantity. And that, that's why this thing here is a, is a four derivative quantity. Uh, where is it here? This thing is a four derivative quantity. Um, so the idea is that if you look at the expression for the, the VA component of the Ricci tensor in these coordinates, you can see it's, it's given by the V derivative of beta plus a bunch of other stuff. Okay? So therefore, we can substitute this, uh, this expression into here and eliminate the V derivative of beta in favor of the Ricci tensor plus all that other stuff. Okay? That other stuff turns out to be stuff we can control. Um, but what we can now do is use the equation of motion, the Einstein equation, to eliminate the VA component of the Ricci tensor. 
And remember the Einstein equation is relating the Ricci tensor to the higher derivative stuff. So the higher derivative stuff is always coming with, with factors of L. So when we eliminate the, the Ricci tensor, it's pushing, it's pushing that term to higher order in L, basically, that, that's the issue. The, the, so it's pushing it to higher derivative order. L, L counts the number of derivatives. So by using the equations of motion, we can push the problem term to the next order in derivatives. Okay, so at each order, we can do this. We can push, push the problem terms to the next order. And so that's why they're, they're not actually problematic. Wait, I think that last sentence is the one that I didn't quite follow. So why can you keep like bootstrapping yourself to higher orders by this argument rather than being stuck only uh, limiting fourth order, fourth derivative? Um, because, okay, so if we have this term, this has already got a factor of L squared sitting in front of it. I've not written that. Um, but this, this is already a four derivative term. So it, in the equations, it would already have an L squared sitting in front of it. Okay, so if I now go through this procedure, I'm now going to get some Ricci tensor uh, term times L squared. Okay, but the Ricci tensor yeah. term is already of order L squared from the equations of motion. It's L squared times some other stuff. So that mm -hmm. those two L squareds are going to combine to an L to the fourth. And L to the fourth, just by dimensional analysis, is only going to multiply six derivative terms. Okay, so it's, it's pushed the whole thing up to six derivatives. And then when we get to six derivatives, problem terms can reappear, but we can just repeat the procedure and push things to eight derivatives and, and so on. Okay, thank you. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I'll go ahead and stop the recording and thank Harvey again for a great talk.